All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and read our uh, opening statement. Folks may be coming in, but you've if you've been with us for two days, you've heard this, um, but we think it's important. Um, so welcome to everybody. Uh, before the session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. Uh, the Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment to all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any harassment, um, harassment of any type by being mindful of the space and time you're taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting that differences in opinion and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual assumptions uh, and biases. Um, so I'll paste the full uh, document in our chat. Um, and then with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to our presenters. Uh, we will uh, hold questions until the end uh, and they'll be happy to take your questions then. Great, so thanks you all. All right, so I think that's over to me. Um, thanks, Allison and Stephanie for the organization. Um, welcome everyone. I'm uh, very happy to join the Open Education Southern Symposium from pretty far north. I'm based in Montreal, Canada. Um, my name is Hugh McGuire. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO at Pressbooks. And we have a wonderful panel here of um, people who are actively engaged in um, all sorts of wonderful programs around creating, adapting, and using OER. Um, as we got together to talk about this, um, it became clear that we wanted to focus on a very specific uh, topic, and it wasn't quite clear what it was, but as we were talking, I think it was Perry who said, you know, one of the big jobs is herding cats. How do we get faculty um, who have a lot of disparate needs and desires involved in OER. Um, and, and the starting point for OER is often about student savings, but we really want to go beyond that and say, student savings are great, but what is it that faculty get out of OER? What can OER or OER creation or participation in OER offer to the faculty that's beyond just doing something good for their students, which is important, but might not be enough to get them over the hurdle of getting engaged. Uh, deeply. So that's the topic. Um, I've, I've got a, um, uh, oh, so this is me. Uh, my name's Hugh McGuire, again, founder and CEO at Pressbooks, also the um, executive director at the um, Rebus Foundation. And, oops, not sure what happened there. Um, and the question that I wanted to pose is why should faculty get involved in making or adopting OER? Um, we've got a great panel here today. We have uh, Kathy S. Miller from Oklahoma State, Elaine Thornton from University of Arkansas, Apoor Bashak from Rebus Foundation, Perry Collins from University of Florida, Robert Browder from Virginia Tech, and myself. Um, I'm going to try to uh, organize this as follows, uh, just a quick intro to what we've been talking about. And then rather than having everyone do uh, intros, um, I'm going to just go right into a question for each of them. Um, in answering that question, you can talk a little bit about your program at your institution, but hopefully we can keep that to about five minutes each uh, to leave us some time. And each of these questions is a little bit about what is it that excites faculty about OER? What have you discovered in your journey? And I would say that each of these, um, each of these institutions have in their way had OER programs for going on for a number of years with a lot of experience and have learned the hard way of what are the things that uh, excite faculty. So I'm going to give just a very quick intro and then we'll get right into the questions for a panel and hopefully we have some uh, time for the audience uh, participants for some question and discussion at the end. So I'll keep everyone to five minutes um, and that should leave 10-ish minutes at the end for questions. Um, and my quick intro is just this, that the starting point for OER engagement is often student savings, which is great, but uh, I think everyone has found that to grow the engagement of faculty with OER, we need to offer them more. OER needs to be delivering them more. So we're gonna be talking to four experts who have years of experience running OER programs and asking this question, what can creating OER offer faculty um, that gets the faculty excited and interested in working with OER? 
And we're going to start with Kathy S. Miller, who's the Open Education Resource Librarian at Oklahoma State University. And Kathy, the first question for you is how has your OER publishing program, including a platform and processes, helped solve the need or desire that faculty have expressed at your institution? So what is it about having a program that is helping faculty get excited, maybe about OER, but, but maybe, maybe just about publishing in general? Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Kathy. Hi, thanks for this chance to brag on my faculty. Uh, when I first came on board here, I think it was 2017, 2018, I'm not sure which one, um, there'd been another librarian really passionate about helping save students money through using OER, uh, who'd been kind of managing some little uh, projects kind of across campus and, and so there were things happening but they weren't really cohesive and then they hired me as a full-time OER librarian and part of my call was to move this shift our program well shift all these passion projects right into a strategic plan and so as we did that we developed some uh, processes through which uh, really just kind of project management type things really and then we also procured the Pressbooks uh, platform we have an an Oklahoma State University branded instance of Pressbooks. And so with those processes in that platform, uh, we were able to come to faculty that we knew had been kind of tinkering with OER or doing something else in their classroom and offer them uh, the support and the resources that they needed to really kind of work within their specialty and amplify their skills and uh, talents and research interests and, and, and really meet what they were trying to do in a way that was replicable and could be more broadly shared out with other people. And on this slide, um, I've got an example of some of the questions that I get from faculty that I love being able to say yes to. And the fact that we have these processes in place, right, from beginning to end with deviations in the middle. And then we have the platform that we can use to publish their work uh, enables me to say yes to these questions. Things like uh, the speech project, a faculty member came to me and they're wanting to, to move all their speech courses to OER. And, and she's saying, we, I wish we could take some of this and some of that and some of this. And it was so grateful to say yes. And she said, can we really do that? And it was exciting to say, yes, yes, you can. Uh, they come to me, is it possible to our nutrition uh, faculty member, is it possible to kind of change this up a little bit to reflect what what uh, the cultural practices are like here in Oklahoma and some, some of the uh, uh, customs and eating uh, traditions that have built up here uh, among the community in Oklahoma. And we were to say yes, yes, with these processes and platform. And, and when they come and they say, oh, I wish I could do this. Uh, I wish I could just write my own book and, and share it out with these friends of mine uh, in California who are teaching the same thing. And because of these processes and platforms, uh, we're able to do that. So uh, basically in a nutshell, when you say how how are we able to grow faculty engagement with OER? We, we bring them into a, a, a community, really. Uh, so they've got people around them. They have people who have an idea of how to handle the, the technological infrastructure. Uh, and then they get to be around other scholars and people who are curious and doing similar things in OER. Excellent. Um, so we have a couple of minutes left for you, Kathy, and, and maybe uh, for the crowd out there, please post questions to the chat and we'll try to um, add them if we have a bit of time at, at the end of each section. But can, can you tell me what is it you think that the, the driving um, interest is of faculty who want to publish? It, are they thinking about OER when they start or is it just something they want to do and OER ends up being the route that they're able to do it through? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I have to say in most of the consultations I end up having, um, it's not necessarily a faculty member who's come to me who says, I want to get involved with OER. It's a faculty member who, who's come and says, I want to leave some other particular resource, or um, I want to save my students money, or I, I wish I could just customize my course and do what I want. And so that, the, the pedagogical innovation and the ability to reflect really their own expertise, I think, is one of the driving forces behind a lot of the faculty that come to me, uh, you know, along with, of course, they're all very much committed to creating the best, most meaningful learning learning experience possible. Um, but that, that most of the folks that have come to me, that's been really the primary reason, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And the, the do you get resistance to OER as a mecha mechanism to do that? Or does that just fall into an obvious uh, thing that they're interested in? Is there, right. do, do you ever have that disconnect between, wait a second, give it away for free? That is the great thing about coming along second. 
Um, I think the librarian who kind of broke the ground for this did meet with some resistance uh, and, and he did the hard work. And so when I came along, uh, everybody had already kind of said, that's not a great idea. And now they're ready to say, oh, wait, yeah, it is a great idea. You know, they've had their chance to push back. Um, we've heard the things they were pushing back with. And so then when I came along, I already had heard some of those uh, well, opportunities to speak into their world. And we we're, we we're better prepared to kind of meet some of their concerns and, and address them a little bit. So I think that um, a lot of people who are first on their campus do meet with that resistance. But I was fortunate that it had already come and gone by the time I came on board. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Kathy. And again, in our whirlwind tour here of a lot of experience, um, we're going to move on to our next. But uh, I encourage actually everyone, if you want to post emails or whatever in the in the chat, if anyone has questions to send along, um, please do. And hopefully we'll have some time at the end to, to hear a little bit from, from all of you. Um, I'm going to go now. Uh, so thanks again, Kathy. I'm going to go now um, to... Elaine Thornton, who's the Open Education and Distance Learning Librarian at the University of Arkansas. And um, we had a little bit of discussion about the exact wording of this question. So hopefully I uh, address this uh, for you, Elaine. But uh, my understanding is that you've had faculty who had reverted rights or rights of textbooks that had been published elsewhere. Um, but because of whatever contract reasons, they had those rights uh, reverted back to them. And OER provided a route to, to publish there. So can, can you tell me, tell us a little bit about that experience and what it was that OER publishing offered those particular faculty who might have had content already? And over to you, Elaine. Okay, so yes, thank you. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that first and then give kind of a couple of other examples that I wanna highlight from the slide. So. We do have a recent case of a faculty member who wanted to update his textbook. He had published with a major commercial publisher and he wanted the third edition of his book to be interactive electronic book. And the publisher was not willing to accommodate. So additionally, on top of all of this, the author found that students were uh, getting his book, um, Sorry. Getting a pirated copy of his book online. Um, so they were finding the PDF and they were, you know, downloading it. And this was something like the textbook company, you know, he thought they should have been um, uh, handling this or making sure this kind of thing didn't happen. And so, you know, he requested a rights reversion, um, especially when they weren't willing to um, help him create the third edition of his book in the way that he wanted to. So he came to the OER team for support in creating the third edition of his textbook as an open resource. He had all of his files and he wanted to produce the book using Bookdown. Um, and you'll see that on the screen, that's the second book called Simulation and Modeling, Simulation Modeling and Arena. It is a book for industrial engineering students. Um, and so, you know, it's been a great experience working with him. Most of the work he did himself because he already had the files. He knew exactly what he wanted to update. It's the third edition of his book. Um, and, you know, the only drawback I've seen with this was um, his insistence on licensing it, licensing it with the no derivatives de designation. And that's not really our program's preference, but it's his choice, it's his work. So essentially he's, he has created a free legal textbook that benefits students. Um, and as I said, you'll see the, the slide here uh, on the slide, the modeling uh, and arena. And so uh, we try to keep the rules simple in our program. Um, we um, keep them minimal. We stress academic freedom in the equation. We do require that they include a Creative Commons license on the work it, that they produce with our funding. We do not require specific publishing tools or platforms, but we do uh, have a ban on indie publications for authors who use our, our Pressbooks platform. So a couple other things I wanted to highlight on this slide. Um, you know, we've been doing pretty much publishing textbooks or helping faculty publish textbooks since the beginning of our program. Um, the, when, it, when our first books came out in 2017, um, you can see the Astronomy for Educators, which was one of our first OER, um, he had already been working on this kind of material. Um, he's an education professor who goes around to conferences, had been handing out like uh, 
printed copies of some of his chapters. And so we just helped him find a wider audience for his book. It was first published as a PDF and put into our institutional repository. Um, at that time, we did not have press books, but we have now a copy of it in press books as well. Um, so our publishing program is really built to empower faculty to produce the OER that they want to produce. Um, it's not built to highlight the library as a publisher, um, but we serve as an avenue to effectively distribute and provide access to open resources for our students. A couple other examples on the slide, the Moving Pictures textbook uh, was created for a gen ed high enrollment course. And um, not only is it popular um, in our, on our campus, but we get adoption notices from schools all around the country um, pretty much weekly. I just got one last night from someone at a community college in Iowa, I think, who is really excited to have access to this book and be able to use it with her students. Um, and then the last book is Human Behavior and Social Environment. It's a social work textbook um, where the instructor wanted to combine about at least six different open textbooks to create a book that worked for her social work students. And she's been like really invested in this. In fact, it was finished a year ago, but she just added slides. Last week, we worked with her to add slides, a link to some slides, an example syllabus. She gets email from social work faculty um, from other campuses, you know, asking her about the book and what she's created. And, you know, she just wants to keep working on it, improving it and making it better for students. So all of these faculty members are very passionate about their teaching and the work they've produced and the benefit to students. So I'll stop here. Happy to answer questions if time allows. We don't have much time and I don't see any questions in okay. the uh, chat, but I have a question for you, Elaine. What do you find the impact is on faculty when they find out that their OER is being adopted in other institutions? Um, in the rest of the country or elsewhere? They're very excited about it. I think some of them are humbled by it, you know, and just, you know, they're happy to be able to share. And one of the great things about um, our faculty here on this campus is that they've really become kind of uh, beacons for the colleagues in their department. So, you know, the more faculty we've gotten involved, the more champions we have because they go out and talk to their colleagues and um, you know, create new, new OER uh, participants for us. Excellent. All right, thanks a lot, Elaine. Um, very exciting. And again, whirlwind tour, we're gonna continue on. Next up um, is Apoorva. Uh, Apoorva is the Director of Open Education at Rebus Foundation um, and Rebus helps uh, well, helps teams of faculty work together to create OER. And the question for Purva is really, can you tell us about the value they get out of having this structured collaboration process? What is it about um, that process that, that helps deliver value to, to faculty and what do you hear back from them? And Purva has a, a few slides. So um, if you just kind of nod at me, Purva, I'll, I'll move to the next one. Hopefully. I'll indicate, thank you, Hugh. Um, so our work with faculty has come mainly through the textbook success program, which is a one year cohort based professional development program that teaches educators the ins and outs of creating OER. Um, it's a very structured and guided process where participants learn to build capacity for OER initiatives at their institutions. Next slide, Hugh. It's a cohort based program and um, anywhere from six to 10 projects a cohort. We have um, project that typically comprise of teams of four individuals. So the cohorts themselves will include um, projects from multiple institutions. You might have folks from Arkansas, you might have folks from University of Houston or other institutions. So what I'll do in the remainder of my time is highlight the impact that this particular model has had with teaching faculty in particular. Next slide, Hugh. So given that teaching faculty get to coordinate with instructional designers, librarians, um, OER coordinators, or program managers through the team and through the cohort, um, one of the main takeaways that faculty have reported is getting an in-depth understanding of these different institutional roles and how they can support the faculty members' work. I think oftentimes faculty don't quite know that these support resources exist on campus 
or when they can contact these individuals. So should I contact them before my course begins or um, can I contact them in the midst of um, teaching a course? So by learning about not only um, the existence or the extent of these services, but also the knowledge, the skill set, and the expertise that these non-teaching staff have to offer, um, I found that teaching faculty will leave the TSB with more respect for this work um, and also um, an understanding of why it's vital and important in the higher education space more broadly. Um, and I'll also flag that these connections and these networks stay beyond the program. So folks find themselves reaching back to these individuals outside of that one year and in doing so building capacity for other kinds of OER work with the institution. Next slide, Hugh. Um, I think also practically faculty learn publishing workflows that they can use on other projects that they're working on. Um, and as um, Kathy was describing, what excites them is the ability to experiment or innovate with the OER they're creating and to also focus on student-centered design. Next slide, Hugh. I think in the process, um, as the other panelists were alluding, faculty get to think about more than just creating OER and instead focus on how OER will be used. Um, you know, the creation process, I think, inherently involves discussions on pedagogy, on teaching, on learning, as creation teams are making decisions on um, how to improve the efficacy of the OER for a particular course or in a particular setting or for a particular group of students. And this impact, I don't think, can be understated. Next slide, Hugh. Thank you. One of our textbook success program graduates, Liza Long, um, describes how the process of creating a first year composition textbook and learning about OER because she was new to um, the world of open education has integrally shaped her thinking about her own pedagogy. So their team included a unit on anti-racist readings and resources in their first year composition textbook. And in doing so, um, she and the other co-authors had to think about how to structure and surface these discussions and conversations with her students. So this was one of those beyond um, cost savings impacts that I've seen. Next slide, Hugh. And I'll say that OER creation in particular can be transformative for faculty beyond just pedagogy. Um, it allows faculty to establish themselves as pioneers or advocates for students champions for a new model of education. Um, and these skills and experiences I've seen highlighted in departments um, when they're showing teaching faculty as an exemplar or at conferences, or better yet, used to advance tenure and promotion um, for these faculty. And uh, last slide, thank you. So Ginny, who is another graduate of the cohort, notes that for many faculty, um, they dream of writing books. Um, some of them, have to do it for tea and tenure and promotion others have a personal goal of offering a book and while this process of creation can be daunting it pays off in many ways so Ginny was featured in her department communications for her work on an oer geology lab manual and i'd like to think that professional development programs like the tsp can help fulfill these very personal goals and give faculty a transferable skill set to use beyond the program and i just want to flag ariana from the university of houston who supported Ginny on this work is in the call so i think this is as much a testament to the support ariana provided as all of the rest so i'll just end to say while the focus of oer conversations is often around student savings it's worth capturing the impact that um, oer creation can have on faculty satisfaction on transforming their practice and also advancing their professional development thank you hugh for being such a helpful navigator excellent uh, thanks apurva um, and again i don't see any questions but i'll, I'll just add a, one follow-up question can, can you talk a little bit more about that uh, about the that sort of career advancement is that something that surprises the the people who are involved in OER creation? Oops, sorry, uh, is that is that a surprise to people when they find uh, that you know are they coming in with that in mind or is that something that sort of surprises them when they find these experiences adding to their professional advancement? In my experience, people do this because of the passion and the desire to want to create a better classroom environment. Um, I think it's a surprise to hear that this work does have a recognition and validation in the more traditional academic and scholarly space. So it's growing long ways to go, but always a good surprise. 
Excellent. All right. Thanks, support. And we'll talk a little bit a little bit later if we have time uh, with Kathy talking about tenure and promotion at, at Oklahoma State. Okay. Next up is Perry. Um, so Perry Collins is copyright and OER librarian at University of Florida. And the question for Perry is, how have you helped your faculty make the case for external funding for various projects using open as a lens for the funding uh, funding proposals? Hey everyone, um, thank you all. And thanks to Hugh for organizing us and having a great um, set of sort of pre-conversations to all of this. I felt like we should have just recorded our initial conversation as a panel itself, but it's been great to have everyone here too. Um, so as he said, I'm Perry Collins. Um, I'm copyright and open education librarian at UF. Um, I'm an editor with the Library Press at UF, which is an imprint of the University of Florida Libraries and our more traditional um, longstanding University Press of Florida. Um, that's been itself a wonderful um, partnership. Um, we also think of ourselves in some ways as in kind of a publishing layer on top of work that's also happening at our Center for Teaching Excellence, at our Center for Instructional Technology. Um, so like many other large research institutions, um, in some ways we're privileged to have an embarrassment of riches. We have a lot of people working in this space. Um, and so in some ways, since I've been here for the last two and a half or three years, a lot of it's been carving out what it looks like for us to take some projects that might have been started in press books or other formats um, and think about what it means to publish and disseminate them um, and all that that sort of entails. So to respond more directly to Hugh's question, um, thinking about funding, um, I'll preface this um, by saying that before I moved into academic librarianship, um, I worked for six years as a program officer for a federal funder for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and really, that's still in some ways how I see the world, how I see many of our projects that we're working on. Um, in some ways, that sometimes that means knowing when not to pursue a grant, when what you have internally is really the best option, and when pursuing a grant might even get in the way or delay some of the work that you're doing. Um, but I think one of the things that I really took away from that part of my career um, is knowing that one of the biggest risks that funders take, and I think this is especially true with digital resources, um, is that it will disappear, right? That the work and the investment um, will dry up along with the funding. And so all of us who have applied for grants are used to answering questions around sustainability, around outreach. Um, you know, we funders really want to know what that will look like. Um, I think um, in some ways, one of the responses from funders has been to have open access mandates or public access mandates, um, mostly for the, so far what we've seen has been focused on sort of scholarly outputs and publications. Um, I think those conversations are bigger and we're seeing them around other kinds of materials as well. Um, but I think my goal in moving into this position in an academic library is to help um, the faculty I work with think about those kinds of mandates as more than a check, um, as more than something that just like is a compliance piece that they have to deal with and it feels like a burden. Um, and I think that in some ways gets at things that we've heard already from several of us about open should not be the end of the conversation, right? It's really um, just something that enables other kinds of work. And we're often using it, at least in our own communities, as shorthand for all the different kinds of things that it might um, allow. So I think this community's knowledge of open in general can really help make the case to funders who are looking for projects that will move beyond a single institution, that will have those broader impacts. But I would say, I think one of the most valuable things we bring to the table is in moving beyond what we often see as broad rhetorical flourishes, right? So in a grant proposal, you often see, and it will be open and everyone will use it, right? And I think we know that's not necessarily the case. And that sometimes no matter what we do, that won't be the case and that's okay. But I think um, there are a lot of ways that as publishers, as librarians, as open education experts, we're able to get into the nitty gritty and help reassure a funder that um, we 
how we can be part of a project team to advise on things like open licenses, um, like digital stewardship, like points of dissemination and access and discovery um, that wouldn't necessarily be something all of our faculty um, would think of first. Um, and so I'll close by saying um, the two projects that I have here um, are ones that I've worked on this year that actually received external funding previous to me even arriving at the university but where I feel like I've been able to step in on one, a more traditional textbook and one, a website with OER materials and offer advice to give that layer of knowledge that will make a funder happy um, and maybe make them um, sort of incentivize future funding or at least um, a really positive outlook on the project. So I'll close there. Excellent, thanks, Perry. Um... And I guess I'll continue the tradition here of asking a, a follow up question. So it's interesting, you know, one of the challenges in the OER world is that um, I think uh, there aren't necessarily that many funders out there funding big programs. Can you tell me about just the reaction that you've had in talking to various funders about this open idea and how that excites maybe someone who wasn't aware or as engaged in the open OER universe as let's say Hewlett is? Sure. I mean, I think really when you dig down into it, many funders are funding OER and they might not call it OER. And I think sometimes that just means we have to be flexible about our language and the way that we're pitching something. Um, at the NEH, sometimes you'll see open, but you'll just as often see the public humanities or um, in science, you might see science communication, or there are just so many ways that we're framing um, uh, language around engaging a broader audience. And I think having that flexibility and not trying to shoehorn it into a proposal, but actually um, will be a willingness to translate is the most important thing and really opens up our funding opportunities too, so that we're not all going for the one program called OER funding, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, that I think that's a very exciting way to think about things because I know that you know funders are looking at ways to have impact, and if we believe that OER is a way to make content have more impact, I think it's a really exciting way to open up new avenues. So um, thanks for that, Perry. Okay, we're going to move along now to uh, Robert Browder, who is the digital publishing specialist at Virginia Tech, and I'm going to change the tenor of the. Um, of the question here. Everyone else we've been asking about what is it that OER can offer to faculty? And I'm changing things up a little bit for Robert's question, which was a little bit more, what is it about faculty who've been successful at publishing OER? What, what have they brought to the table that has made them uniquely successful? Um, so what are the characteristics of a faculty member who goes on to be a successful OER creator or publisher or, or adapter? And over to you, Robert. Yeah, this this is a really interesting question, I think, and thank you for for sharing it with me. I think that uh, a lot of the the faculty that I've worked with who su find success in creating an OER is is that they bring their own incentives with them. Oftentimes, like uh, a lot of times, we don't have to incentivize those faculty members. They already have a deep and genuine love of their subject and their role as teacher, mentor and promulgator of knowledge. Uh, so creating an OER for, for these type of faculty members is just a natural extension of their career and a natural extension of their work that they're already doing. It, it's, they would be doing it anyway through informal class notes or something like that, but through working with us, we're able to give them a platform and a mechanism for formalizing that work that they're already doing and sharing that work that they're already doing. Uh, I noticed that uh, a lot of our most successful faculty members are already tenured and maybe late career faculty members. Some of them approach an OER project as a legacy donation to the field that they're in love with and to the field that they have spent their life teaching in. So, so for some of, some of our most successful faculty members, that's what they're doing. They're making a gift to the field and to the students of the field. So uh, that, that, that's, and it's a really meaningful thing. So it's got a deep connection with who they are and, and what they're doing. And that deep connection gives them to the tenacity to push through 
anything that comes up to push through any unexpected problems that arise. It, that, that deep personal connection with what they're doing uh, just helps them be tenacious and it helps them find resources for the project. Like uh, if they don't have the resources for the project when they bring it to us, then, then they can help us find resources oftentimes or they can help, they can assemble their own project team and connect them with us in a larger collaboration. So, so I think that deep personal connection to what they're doing is, is one of the really key things. Uh, something else is like most faculty who are, who are successful in creating an OER have some experience with, with publishing of some kind. You know, they've, they've published academic papers throughout their career. They've published maybe a few monographs. Maybe they've collaborated on other textbooks that were, uh, yeah, in, in, the, in the course of their career. Uh, but they also are able to accept and respect the somewhat experimental nature of OER. You know, sometimes OER is not a, you don't always have a template for every kind of project that comes your way. And that's part of what's exciting about it. And uh, our successful faculty, they, they accept that and they respect that and they accept their, their role as experimenter and, and ex accept that things may not go as planned all the time, but, but they're, they're able to, to, you know, connect with, find that personal connection and, and push on. So, uh, so that, that, those, are the, those are the main characteristics that, that stand out to me among our most successful OER creators at Virginia Tech. Excellent, Thank, thanks Robert. I'm gonna pick up on, it's interesting, I think um, the dynamic between Robert and Apoorva, that Apoorva I think was talking about the ways in which OER can help maybe more early career faculty in gaining, um, gaining some recognition in the wider world. And, and what you're talking about, Robert, is that someone at the end of their career who is looking at what legacy they want to leave and, and leaving a mark. And I'm curious about, about that exchange that you've seen within Virginia. Is it, is it largely the, the later, um, later career faculty? Do you have a mix of both? Um, what's the interplay between those two? We, we do have a mix of both. We do have a mix of both, but I, I feel that Oftentimes, late career faculty just have a little more time for the project. They're able to carve out just a little more time for the project, while, while early career faculty who are working their way through the promotion and tenure process, they're really strapped for time, and they often have young families as well. So they're trying to get their paper into their journal and be at the soccer game and, and everything else, you know, whereas a, a later career faculty member just has a little more autonomy as far as their time. But, but we do have some early career faculty members. And, and you know, how OER fits into the, the promotion and tenure process at Virginia Tech is not entirely clear to me. Like, I, I think it, it is probably very subjective de depending on what department you might be working in because, uh, you know, we, we have some faculty who are all about OER and have complete respect for it and and some faculty who just kind of shrug you know so excellent um well that leads us into um Kathy who whoops so, uh, Kathy who's going to uh finish things off and talk about some exciting things at um at Oklahoma State whoops uh and the question for Kathy then and thanks Robert for that I think very interesting but the uh, question for Kathy is should OER creation count towards tenure and promotion and what happens if it is. So over to you, Kathy. Excellent. I'm so excited again to share uh, what Oklahoma State has done with this. Our provost, who is in whose image is in the next slide, um, spoke out in favor of and in support of consideration of the modification or creation or really even incorporation of OER as scholarly work for retention, tenure, and promotion um, here at Oklahoma State University. We are a olden days R1, I guess now it's very high research institution. Uh, so the, we, we have the three legged stool, right? And and they had kind of made a case for, well, OER is service or OER is teaching, but we had faculty saying, really, I need it to count as scholarship. Why doesn't it count as scholarship? And as we looked at it and we, we compared 
uh, what the research indicates about open educational resources and open practices with retention, promotion, and tenure dossier documents, there's there's really a lot of overlap. And you you saw it uh, and heard it probably in these conversations today. And let me just show you some of them. Uh, Aperva mentioned that faculty uh, creating OER established themselves as pioneers and innovators. And you go look in those uh, retention, promotion, and tenure documents and that's what they're looking for people that have had an impact on the field people that have made a significant contribution to the body of knowledge of the field and that's definitely a pioneer and innovator um and she mentioned that they're surprised when they discover it is legitimate scholarship and as we've done through gone through and done some text analysis uh it it very much it very much is we don't have to set oer aside as something separate uh, it integrates with practices and standards that already exist uh, in the scholarly world. Perry mentioned that uh, all the things that open will allow. It's not an end of it in and of itself. All the things that will allow and those things that allows are the things that show up in the tenure documents. Uh, Elaine mentioned the adopt a book uh, link that they have in there and that we'll pull in stuff like that to show uh, the reach we have. Um, one soil science book that's being used out in California. And definitely that's a great way then for that faculty member to be able to document their reach and their impact on the field. Uh, Roberts mentioned faculty's role as experimenter, which definitely fits in with what departments are looking for as they're deciding whether or not to make a commitment to um, a scholar and a researcher and their, their career there at the institution. So what I do is go through, uh, and I, I also ask for each of our grant awardees to share with me what their research interests are, kind of what their commitment, what their trajectory is scholarly wise. That wasn't a good word, but, um, and then I write a letter that pulls from the language of the open literature and also pulls from their HPT documents. And we send a letter from the Dean uh, here at the library, acknowledging and thanking them for their contribution to uh, the scholarly field associated with their discipline. Does that make sense? Um, so that's kind of, that's the take, that's what we've done. We're not, we're not trying to get OER put into documents. We're reading those documents and we're reading the literature and we're saying it doesn't need to be its own thing. It already completely is integrated into what you're looking for. Um, I think that's pretty amazing, Kathy. And I agree with Elaine who's posted here that I think Frankly, I think that OER being recognized broadly as part of tenure and promotion would completely change the game of incentives and time spent in OER. Um, and I think if you've had success at that, I'm sure there are a lot of people who'd love to hear about it. So thanks for that. I think that uh, rounds out the discussion really well. Um, I, whoops. Uh, the link to this uh, presentation will be sent around and you can see this great video from the provost. Um, whoops, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we're now going to open up for questions from the participants. Um, and I know it's the uh, last session of the day, but, uh, if there aren't any questions, I also, uh, if we don't have anyone from the crowd asking, I encourage the group here, um, to ask some questions of each other. And I don't see any questions yet from there. So I don't know if anyone has one on the tip of their, their tongue for someone else. I'm looking at my notes because I did jot a couple down, but I have to remind myself what they were. All right, I think, well, maybe I won't ask this of Kathy, but I wonder, I, I wonder about this tenure and promotion. I think that what's exciting about what Kathy's done is that it's not, she said, making the case for OER as a new thing, but rather looking at the case for tenure and promotion and saying, actually, OER meets these criteria. Um, I think it would be really interesting to share that sort of matrix. Um, and I suspect there'd be a lot of enthusiasm around that. That is something, um, that I would love to see more of. I don't know if there's any, there's head nodding there, but any comments from, from any of the, the panelists here about that? And maybe I'll pick on Perry, for instance, who I saw nodding vociferously there. I am, I'm too much of a nodder. I don't know. <laughs> I think during the pandemic, I've started doing it more. Like you have to emote a bit more over Zoom, right? 
Um, yeah, no, I mean, I just think this is a great way of framing it, Kathy, and I really thank you for bringing this up. It's something I've started to think about. Um, I think I mentioned in the chat, a lot of the interest we've had have been from non-tenure track folks who are faculty lecturers um, or sometimes professional staff as well in roles where they're involved in, in teaching or pedagogy. Um, and I think that promotion piece for me has been just as important as the tenure piece. Um, how can we make sure that we're helping so that this isn't just yet another extra among all the extras, right? That it actually counts toward what they need. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question maybe to Patty or Kathy? Um, Kathy, do you often foreground um, the type of support you will provide to folks with their TNP dossiers? Maybe while you are um, setting up that uh, mini OER grant or or something else. So is this something they hear about before they even start doing the creation work to incentivize them further? We are right now formalizing an open OK State Fellows title that will give us the opportunity to speak to that at the very beginning. You're becoming an open OK State Fellow. What does that mean? It means you're going to get tenure. You know, so we are right. So far, it's been informal. Just that the, the people who are in a relationship with me, uh, and and you know, they talk to me. They know from just communication that I very much believe it counts as scholarly, scholarly and creative work, and that I can make a case for it. Um, but we are moving to make it easier for people to discern uh, before they even have that consultation with me. Yeah, I'd imagine that would be especially reassuring and maybe even more motivating for them to come and do that work. And Robert, would you think, would that encourage more of the non-tenure track folks who are at your institution at Virginia Tech um, to be part of the process? Gosh, it's, it's really tough for, for, for me to say. Uh, uh, I would like to think so, certainly. <laughs> yeah, I would like to think so. I think that, uh, you know, opening up the the making a more clear incentive base for early career faculty is, is everything that we can do to encourage that and negotiate that is and promote that is important to the work, no doubt. Excellent. All right. So I don't see any questions here. I have to say, I, I have a theory about OER that, um, that the real value is what the faculty who make OER get out of it. And there's this great, amazing fringe benefit, which is that students get access to free free content. And, and it's just partially just my philosophy that the, the power of creating is, is so wonderful. And I feel that a little bit about this um, panel. I feel like I learned a lot here and it was great talking with all of you. I hope that the attendees as well who were quiet in the background enjoyed this. Um, I think we have a couple of uh, one minute early, so maybe we can let everyone have an extra minute in their day. Um, but thank you all for a really delightful conversation. There was a lot of information there, but uh, really interesting. And thanks so much for, for doing that. And thank you to um, Allison and, and Stephanie for the organization. Great, thanks everyone for a great panel. Have a good evening. Yes, thanks everybody.